All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. This is episode number 15, Question and Answer with Dr. Baraki. I'm hey. Dr. Feigenbaum. What's up? We're here in the Baraki, not to be confused with Dothraki. Mr. How's Mike. Mike? Mr. Mike. <laughs> Mr. Mike. Austin, how's it going, buddy? It's going all right. Glad to have you here. All right. We're going to jump right into this thing. We're going to start doing questions. These are from the Instagrams. So not quite as bad comment-wise as YouTube. Mm. And, but we're going to go with it. Do it. So thank you for submitting comments. That could be a problem. Also, <laughs> if a cat walks into the shot, it's not, it's not a problem. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. It's fine. All right. First question here as we load. Uh, Alex says you've got those White Walker eyes. I'm sure he's talking to you since it was a picture of you. Can you confirm that I... I'm not a White Walker. I can confirm. You're not. Can confirm. Has tried to kill me. Still, still here. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that means I've never I am seen a little... the uh, the uh, bright blue tinge to your eyes. So I think you're good. Yeah. I... <laughs> All right. All right. Let's see. Serena asks, "How does one get adequate sleep when the urge to pee happens a few times a night when getting older?" I saw this pondered on a recent Starting Strength post as well. This is something that typically deal more with in men who uh, develop prostate issues as they get older. What's um, a prostate? Prostate is a small organ, I suppose would be the technical. Is it an organ? Yeah, it's, it's a gland. It's a gland. It's a gland, yeah. And uh, the majority of the, of the prostate uh, gland surrounds the urethra, uh, which is the exit tube for urine. I like that, the exit tube. Yes. yes. The yes. prostate's a gland. It sits between the bladder and the actual penis. Yeah. Um, so, and that gland can become enlarged through a handful of different pathologies, most commonly benign prosthetic hyperplasia, which just means the gland gets bigger, mm-hmm. and so that can compress on the urethra, yeah. which basically, when you empty the bladder, it's less complete. So you have to go more often. Right. And yep. you get the sense that you need to go more often. Yeah. So that's in males. Yeah. Female-wise. Female-wise, this is, would be less typical for us to hear about as an issue in the middle of the night. A lot of times you need to start going down the route of, does this patient or does this person have some form of urinary incontinence issues, urge incontinence type things? I kind of go down that line. Sure. Um, but if they're having issues in the middle of the night, I also have to address or assess their, you know, how much fluid they're drinking throughout the day, exactly. things like yeah. that, to make sure that they're not going overboard with that. Or if they're, you know, let's say they're drinking... Tons of fluids with their training, and they train late at night if that's an issue, and then yeah. they end up dealing with that in the middle of the night. That'd be another thing to think about. That's a cat's head, just FYI. So nocturia is obviously urinating overnight, and I think you hit the nail on the head. You would definitely have to address lifestyle sort of things, mm-hmm. so how much fluid you're drinking. Because if, yeah, let's say you drink six liters a day, and you drink three of them you know, within the two hours prior mm-hmm. to sleep, well, that just makes sense that you're going to have to pee more often overnight. And if it's disrupting your sleep, that is compromising your uh, sleep efficiency, so uh, how much of the time you spend in bed you're actually asleep, or your REM cycles because you're actually waking up all the time, sure. then certainly that'd be something to address. Um, and then we could really go down the rabbit hole as far as like, you know, uh, going to the bathroom, having accidents, something like that. But I don't think that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So first things first, just would assess when you're taking your fluids in during the day. Try to adjust that and follow up with your doc. Mm-hmm. All right. Regular John 33. Some people tend to have a squat and deadlift with, within close proximity of each other, and some have a significant gap between the squat and the deadlift. In your experience, what are some of the reasons? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually made a post about this recently because uh, for me personally, I've always considered my deadlift to be a pretty stubborn lift until I realized that I just was preferentially training harder the lifts that I liked more, which was primarily the squat. So my squat ended up tending to be a, a stronger lift for me than my deadlift, relatively speaking. Um, and so I think that's part of it is that you'll kind of whether consciously or subconsciously end up training harder at lifts that you enjoy more and that'll end up making them making you better at one compared to another. And then you'll kind of become a cycle where you'll train that harder and it'll get better at it. The other consideration, of course, is people's proportions and things like that. And that'll obviously impact, you know, how they're built, uh, you know, fade more or less favorably for a certain for a certain lift. And so sometimes you'll have these freak deadlifters who are not as good of squatters because of their, say, their femur lengths or something like that. But So you would say those shorter, shorter femurs, um, longer arms, certainly. Um, yeah, but I, I do agree that most of the time you see this preference towards a lift uh, manifest out as being stronger in a lift. Mm-hmm. Um, alternatively, if someone who's very, very large might have difficulty setting up correctly right. or comfortably, although... For the deadlift. For the deadlift. Right. Mm-hmm. We're having smaller hands, and so mm-hmm. there's a grip problem. So, yeah, why do the super heavyweight squat 1,000 pull 800? Yeah. 
you know, it's not because they don't train their deadlift. Mm-hmm. It's uh, mainly because grip is a limiting factor. You also don't get that sort of uh, additional stretch reflex off of the off of the meat off the meat. <laughs> BRB, finding out a way to bounce off the meat. <laughs> All right. Kia 33 Free Spirit Yoga. It's a great name. Yeah. I like it. I think she's down in Brazil or something. Yeah, she's cool. We're going to go see you. Uh, speak. Once we, once we learn Portuguese. Yeah, BRB learning Portuguese. <laughs> These are the best podcasts. The one with the Australian rheumatologist was amazing. Looking forward to... Oh, that's not a question. Not one question mark. Thanks, All right. Though. Thank you. <laughs> Synfusion. What is the real reason you can squat and deadlift more with the belt on? Neural efficiency improves. Your cord is tighter, so it's a better transmitter of force to the bar, or both. Uh, so I think this is mainly uh, there are a handful of reasons. So reason number one, you're increasing uh, muscular activity, based on, and that's verifiable through EMG because the intramuscular pressure actually ex- is increased. So you get to use more motor units. So the trunk becomes more rigid. So that's uh, transfers force better. So that's thing one. Thing two, certainly a psychological aspect. Yes, for sure. Yeah, and that's and I think that plays over to other uh, things like knee sleeves, for instance. So knee sleeves store and belt, the, the knee sleeves and the belt, neither of them store mechanical energy uh, in that they actually help with the lift mechanically, um, but the psychological benefits of wearing both the belt or knee sleeve, um, we did. Yeah. Yeah, so that helps. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, in addition to the increased uh, muscular activity, psychological benefit, you actually do get intro more intra-abdominal, intra-thoracic pressure, mm-hmm. which also augments that sort of keeping the, the lever or the back segment more, more rigid. Yeah, I agree. I was definitely going to comment on the psychological. I got you. Hey, nature. family medicine, bro. For sure. Family yeah, medicine. Yeah, yeah. Also, can you remove tempo squats from the bridge? It's truly an awful experience. Look, no. Hey, no. <laughs> Look, I don't care how comfortable your training is. I only care about the results. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Got Gus Kirkhoff, one, says strength training over the years and heart health. Not a question. Good article on starting strength forum I read, but lots of misinformation out there. Work in a sniff as a PTA, and I'm held back by the doc uh, that preaches heavy lifting about solve over time. It's hard on the heart. Don't do it. Even in population of folks with no existing heart conditions. So, all right. Take it. So I'm trying. Let, let, me, let me look at this to make sure I have the question straight. But part of the issue here, you work in a sniff. Uh, by sniff, I assume, because you spelled out the word sniff, you mean a skilled nursing facility. That's a good acronym. And if you're working in a skilled nursing facility, you are, I mean, basically give up now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you are not going to be able to put into practice. Uh, the system is in no way going to facilitate your ability to put into practice a lot of the stuff that we preach in, a, in the setting of a skilled nursing facility. <laughs> Additionally, when you say that you are held back by a doc, is it doc or doc PT? Uh, that says that heavy lifting in the Valsalva over time is hard on the heart, etc. That stuff, again, does not come into play when it comes to your practice of rehabilitating folks in a skilled nursing facility. I don't think that's a, you know, you, you are not going to be training these people over the long term and worrying about their heart health as the PTA in the skilled nursing facility. Of course, outside of the context of all this, when it comes to um, strength training, resistance training, perform- performing the Valsalva and heart health, all that stuff is bunk, as we have discussed a number of times before and written about as well. What's going on over there? I'm just recharging. Oh, okay. Still rolling audio. Okay. All right. Cool. Good. Yeah. Cool. Cool. <laughs> right, this next one's weird. Renee Mathis asks, if you have to high bar squat, what do you recommend to develop the hamstrings or is the deadlift enough? I actually think the deadlift stuff, uh, particularly for a novice, right? So, and even if you're not a novice, I think that choosing the squat as a hamstring dominant exercise is probably suboptimal overall. Somewhere, Greg Knuckles just took his shirt off for his validation, <laughs> beats his chest. No, but I don't think anyone's arguing that the squat is a great hamstring movement and that if you high bar squat or even if you front squat it um, and still deadlift it from the floor, that your hamstrings remain untrained. Mm-hmm. I think that when you get into a position where you're seeking, greater hamstring development overall that you wouldn't pick a certain squat variation to That's, train that. Right. Yes. Yeah, it's that just a byproduct. primary right. choice. It's just sure. a byproduct of, of training mm-hmm. squat. Uh, and then when you get later on, you may in fact have to do RDLs or a stiff-legged deadlift or something or else. more deadlifts. Or more deadlifts. Yeah. Yep. Because train uh, developing the hamstrings um, is probably not fully accomplished by the squat, which is why we deadlift. I would, yeah, I would agree. Certainly not accomplished by the squat to a significant degree. Rory Megan says, Bacon's bi-belts. 
Bacon Bibles Barbell. You know, that, that's a mouthful. <laughs> that's like alliteration. There's so many, there's so many plural, plurals there. I can't deal with it. There's not a question. All right. What's up, Rory? Mitchell underscore Bellin. Do you guys prefer, it, it says prefer, P-E-R-F-E-R. Okay. D-U-P or block periodization? Uh, my thing, they're not necessarily separate. Right. You can do both. Yeah, you can do both. Guess what? West side is D-U-P. <laughs> Mines explode everywhere. So that's the thing. So, so just a brief aside, uh, I got dragged into this conjugate Facebook group, right? Because somebody was talking about how I said that West Side was bad, mm-hmm. which I didn't say. I basically said that all of the things that make West Side West Side have no evidence suggesting that they're uniquely responsible for the strength improvement, right? And what I mean by that is are these uh, what we would call uh, uh, less conventional variations. The things that make West Side. Yeah, yeah. Band chains. Things that I'm sure. Yeah, these waves that they, they go. All those things that are unique that are not necessarily seen in other trained methodologies. But all West Side is is a template of DUP, right? I mean, Lane Norton's PHAT program from back in the day, that's a type of DUP, daily undulating periodization. Zordos has a type of DUP. So Zordos isn't only DUP, and West Side isn't only West Side. Um, anyway, that's just on the side. But that thread... In the Facebook group, you mean? Oh, my gosh. So it's like 90 comments deep before this guy, who's actually you know another well-educated human, was like... Correct. There's no data to suggest, you know, any unique benefit, blah, sure. blah, blah. However, studying this stuff is difficult and West Side may be yeah. useful. I'm like, yep. okay, <laughs> that's just what I was thinking. But somebody, Anthony Roberts, who's like the moderator slash X, like super strong West Side guy was saying, oh, there's all these studies. And I was like, it's like, hey, yeah, yeah. If there's studies. I want to see them. Yeah, yeah. I could be screwing things up. There's no studies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we get asked a lot of these kind of questions about these kind of different periodization schemes. and. Just the way the questions are asked kind of uh, seem to imply that the question asker does not really have a great grasp on programming on well on on what they're asking about. Oh, because, sure. Okay. Like you know what I mean? Because it's like if you understand what those things are, yeah, you can see that they're not mutually exclusive. And you wouldn't ask that diametrically question. opposed. And you wouldn't ask that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like what's better, text method or RPE? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I'm just saying. Post that on Rip's Q and A. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Patty Lynch underscore five. Is there any benefit at all to the sumo deadlift? Uh, sure. If you can't train the conventional deadlift for whatever reason, mm-hmm. I think you and your wife have both come through periods of time where you had to sumo exclusively for various reasons. So those re- pe- reasons why I have people do sumo. If when they do conventional, it really hurts something that doesn't allow them to otherwise productive, productively train their conventional deadlift. Um, if when they set up in the correct deadlift position, their hips are actually higher than their shoulders, Agreed. then you would sumo. Um, alternatively, sometimes in like GPP or developmental blocks, I'll have people do sumo as an assistance lift, mainly because I think it's just a variant of the deadlift. Mm-hmm. I'm not married to anything, but for novices, I think most people should probably learn to pull conventionally. Yeah, I agree. And, and the other situation, in addition to the ones that you mentioned, would be obviously a high-level competitive lifter who performs sumo. Significantly for the, Yeah, for the, for, who performs sumo for the sake of their competitive total. But additionally, those lifters, at least the ones that I coach, some of whom, one of whom, one of whom in particular is extremely strong, I also have her doing tons of conventional work. Because it just makes her stronger. Because it makes her back stronger more effectively. What do you mean by more effective? I'm just joking. I'm not going to troll you. Yeah, let's not. Let's not. <laughs> uh, Laura Gibbs, 84. She is a Olympic, uh, uh, what, it's bobsled, right? They push from the top. It's bobsled. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you make a bobsled? Well, there's a few different things that go down the ice. There's the skeleton as well, but oh, like, I, one that one's by yourself. That one's solo. Oh, okay. I think this is with the team. With the team. Yeah, I think it's with the team. All right, cool. She says hashtag stud, which I agree. Fair, fair. <laughs> Res Billy, should I finish a workout if I get a muscle tweak while training? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Uh, although he does say. Ergo, I just got a stiff neck, upper back while doing chins. In the past, I would train through it and end up being hurt for a week. Okay, so this is very interesting. So Very interesting. Thank you. Two, two parts here that I'm going to talk about. One is the tweak. Of course, the best way to make a tweak feel better is to continue moving through ranges of motion that you can tolerate, um, and they will tend to get better very quickly. Notice he said tolerate. Yes. So not... As opposed to oh, not move through intolerate. agony. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. My, my rule of thumb is, you know, uh, there's, you could say a lot about the pain scale, the one to 10, how to be 
you know, not very sensitive and obviously tons of influences. Yeah. But my general rule of thumb, if something goes greater than a four or five out of 10 on the pain scale, as you move through range of motion, you have to stop the range of motion prior to that, that pain. Yeah. And, and you're, you're going to try to progress it to a normal range of motion, not right. a super normal range of motion. But, but yeah, that may take a few days. Yeah. And even if there's part of the range of motion of the normal lift that you can, that you, that you can move through pain free, and then you hit a point where there's pain, then just stick in that little range of motion and see if you can add a little bit to the range of motion. And that can be your way to yeah, kind of progressively day. overload your, your range of motion through the tweak and it'll get better. Yeah. But part two, this question, you mentioned about having a stiff, stiff back. Stiff like that. neck. All right. So no there is a, I, I, and I'm interested to talk about this because there's a brand new uh, paper that came out recently that I just read earlier today. I'm planning to talk about it at our seminar this weekend. We're talking about it with our uh, stuff on the stuff I do on pit back pain in the future. Um, I cannot cite the specific title of it for you. Maybe we can like put it in our show notes or something like that because it's actually it's open access, very interesting paper about um, basically the perception of back stiffness in people who have chronic, not specific low back pain. Yeah. And so they did a number of little sub experiments that were all cited in this paper. So they like said like, all right, so it's like a discussion about this concept in general. They like, all right, study one A, we did this. Study one B, we did this. And sure. they cite their data for each one. And so among other things, some of the findings that they found were that the findings that they found, the, yeah, the the data that they collected basically showed that they basically set up a mechanism by which they could measure uh, the, the, uh, the mechanical stiffness of someone's spine. So, you know, basically like how much force it would take to say deform it to a certain degree or something like that as a, as a measure of stiffness, for example. So it's just like a voluntary force production thing to like well, anti-flexion or anti-extension kind of thing? They had, this, they had this like gadget set up on them that was actually like pushing into their spine a little bit. And I guess measuring the biomechanical oh, okay. uh, like uh, kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, so they were collecting these people, they had a group who had, back pain, chronic back pain, that a group who didn't have back pain, they had them rate their back stiffness. Obviously, the people who didn't have back stiffness tend to say, I don't really, who didn't have back pain tend to say, my back's not particularly stiff. And the group who had back pain, they're all rating how severe their back stiffness was on a scale of whatever. And then they go and they put them through this protocol to measure how physically stiff their actual back was. And there's no difference between their right, group right. and the group that didn't have any back pain. Stiff, yeah. So basically, what they, conc- what they drew from that was that so this, the, the perception of back stiffness is exactly that. It's strictly a perception, as with a lot of this chronic pain stuff, it's meted a lot centrally. And it's thought to be perhaps a protective mechanism. You perceive the stiffness, it makes you maybe less likely to venture out into what you perceive to be threatening ranges of motion and things like that. So when you say mediated centrally, you mean through the brain? Through the brain. The central nervous system. Right. When we say central, central nervous system, spine, CNS. And your brain yes. uh, are mediating or controlling your perception of that stiffness or not anything inherent to your back itself. So the muscles itself aren't stiff. Right. The spiny, the spinal segments, the bony anatomy is not stiff. Correct. And so this is, this is interesting when it comes to talking to folks who say, you know, or who ask us on a completely different topic, who talk to us about stretching. What if I feel stiff and stretching makes me feel better and stuff like that? And it's like, well, that's where this gets interesting because your stiffness is probably all just this perception. It's nothing actually going on in your tissues, which makes you wonder about if you feel better from stretching, it's probably just a completely kind of a perceptive or a perceptual or a neurological mechanism as opposed ah. to, again, what we talk about, the tissue level changes being less significant than people like to believe. All right. Um, the other things they found in the study had to do with people who had back pain consistently over rating. They, so they, they did, a, they did a, an experiment where they basically applied a certain amount of force to their back and they had the the study subject estimate how much force was being applied to their back. After like a controlled number of newtons, they said, compare this. How much do you think this was relative to that? The people who had chronic back pain consistently overestimated how much force was being put on their back. Again, their brain is being in hyper-protective, hyper-vigilant mode. Everything is, everything is threatening, dangerous, you know, stuff like that. So it's super interesting. You know, this reminds me of, it's like, it's like you have somebody who's previously been, you know, either physically abused or battered or something like that, and they sort of have this preemptive stress response mm-hmm. to like an encounter with, you know, uh, another another person. Yeah. They feel like they're about to get, you know, they're constantly wound up, and that's like a phrase I've heard used to describe this is, is about that type of. Well, that's a, you probably just need stretching, right? That's what you're saying. You need to unwind it. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I don't mean to minimize, you know, low back pain and chronic pain in general, and certainly, you know, emotional stress from previous experiences is not something to minimize. However, I think the main point that we're trying to make is that the perception of something does not make it uh, a real pathology 
requiring massive intervention outside of this sort of getting you to think about it differently. Right. So that's that's the main thing that is, is I'm not obviously, yeah, I agree. We're not minimizing it. And we're also not telling people that it's all in their head because that's like a terrible phrase to use. Yeah, well, but everything's all this, head, this, right? this, under, this understanding actually is most useful to inform your therapeutic approach. Yes. So it helps to guide what you actually do with people. Whereas what, instead of focusing on me loosening your spine or mobilizing your spine, right. I can teach you about this stuff and make you less afraid and let, feel less threatened and help you move through ranges of motion. And this stuff will probably get better and you won't have to worry about doing your mobility work every day for the rest of your life. Doing. Yeah. You, missed, you missed the scare quotes. All right. <laughs> Johnny underscore California says, you said you pretty much eat the same thing all every day. So you only count macros roughly every three weeks. I didn't say that. I said <laughs> I, said I count macros two to three times a week. It's like spot checking. Yeah. What does a day uh, a week look like for you in AZD? So Austin has a different approach. His approach is that he weighs himself nightly and he must go to bed above a certain weight. Right. Just to make sure that he's taken enough food. Yeah. Um, you know. I do eat consistently day to day generally. A lot, of, a, lot, a lot of the similar things as, as most people in this situation do. But yeah, that's how I monitor myself is through weighing. Yeah. No, weighing, not weighing. <laughs> Wait, weighing. Okay. <laughs> weighing. No, not, okay. Um, and I actually refuse to specifically say what I eat. Because I'm afraid that somebody else is going to take that as appropriate for them, and then they're going to eat it. Yeah, that's true. Not for you. Yeah. Every meal has a good protein source. Every meal has a good carb source for me. Some meals have more fat than others. That's basically my general rule of thumb, and I titrate the energy sources, carbs, and fat as needed. And so what percentage of the day would you estimate that you spend in ketosis? Uh, I mean, well, I'm always making ketone bodies, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. So when you look at the, uh, the systematic uh, reviews of, like, ketogenic studies, you find that actually not uh, almost none of the actual studies when people are they're studying ketosis and that they're actually doing a ketogenic diet and or, or and are verifiably in ketosis so they don't prove that they're correct so in fact only one study in this meta-analysis that i'll be including um they weekend. actually measured daily urinary ketone bodies wow. yeah to verify that the people being compliant but you know if your protein for instance is over 20 percent of your kil kilocalories yeah uh, then you're not in ketosis anymore. You have a significant uh, gluconeogenic load that basically takes you out of ketosis. If your carbohydrates are greater than you know, 20, 30, 40 grams a day, you're not in ketosis. Even though you're making ketone bodies, you're not in ketosis, relying pro pro uh, primarily on ketone bodies for people. Also, your LDL is probably not happy. <laughs> Seriously, the LDL goes up like yeah. every single time. Weird, huh? Cool. <laughs> Valerie and MD. She says, we need one of these barbell medicine seminars on the East Coast. All right, we're coming. Yeah. Sometime. We're on our way next year. Next year. Jacob Ancy asks, benefits, if any, of push-ups? Just low, low fatigue, uh, upper body volume. It's not very good at getting you strong because it's hard to load. Range of motion is fairly fixed. Um, and I don't know. I don't use push-ups that much for, unless people are being tested on push-ups. So my military, exactly. my military cohorts, my CrossFit cohorts, yep, same. they do push-ups. How about a Chicago trip? Hey, maybe. All right. I'd find us a gym. That's the thing. You guys who want us to come to your city, find us a gym that'll host us. We come in. And we'll do it. Yeah, we're basically like parasites. Yeah. Find us a host <laughs> and we'll come. Yes. All right. Isaac. G5. Is there any legitimacy behind diets focused on the elimination of foods to reset the body's hormones, allegedly causing large amounts of weight loss and becoming more aware of negative side effects that certain food, food groups have on your body? This is like three different questions. Yeah, I don't really follow this question, unfortunately. So there is no legitimacy to eliminating diets to reset your body's hormones. Because mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean anything. Correct. Uh, with one exception, the exception would be theoretically if you have somebody who is very insulin resistant and you lower their carbohydrate load, um, then you're gonna improve their insulin sensitivity. Uh, however, if you have a potential food allergy, the one of the easiest like sort of back, you know, back home or backyard fixes to this is to do just a standard elimination diet. Mm -hmm. So you eliminate all the common food allergens, you know, egg, dairy, fish, uh, nuts, um, you know, stuff like that, see how you do, and then gradually reintroduce them one by one to see if there is an inciting agent. Uh, although I would say that if you're going down that road and the symptoms are significant enough for you to un to go through that, then you should probably be being followed by an allergy and immunologist, or at least have a consultation. Sure, because they're better able to guide you with that. You know, 
I see the pluribus says, you look ready. I am ready. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Oh, Isaac has a follow-up. That is with addition that once eliminated, foods are systematic. Yeah, so we covered that. All right. Lactate is love. You've previously recommended strength training as a treatment for non-specific low back pain and training through back tweaks. Would this also apply to someone with radiculopathy symptoms? You can cover that. Sure. <laughs> All right, let's make this more interesting. When wouldn't you have a guy or gal training with a barbell with low back pain? Uh, just, yeah, what would be contraindications to training? Yeah, the typical the, the, the typical red flag things that we that we talk about are motor weakness. So if you have you know true weakness in one of your legs, um, so foot drop as an example. Yeah, perhaps. sure. Um, saddle anesthesia is another commonly uh, commonly cited red flag that we talk about. And that's basically if you have numbness and tingling that's centered in your groin. Um, if you're having spontaneous, or I guess it would be spontaneous, if you're having incontinence of urine or of stool, you're just peeing yourself, pooping yourself. That's a that's, that's unusual for definitely you. Definitely concerning. That's new. Yeah, <laughs> that's not something that you habitually do. Well, you yeah, know. yeah. I, but I, sensory only symptoms. Um, I don't. I don't freak out too much about training people who have sensory only symptoms if they've if you know they've been dealing with this and they yeah. come in and they say that sometimes I have some sciatic type symptoms when I bend over or something. I'm like, yeah, well, you can, you can train. The majority of these are self-resolving. They get better on their own. Yeah, that's where I was going. I mean, because his rationale is that in PT school, you'd probably be told that it's an issue with the L5 nerve root and that training through it would not relieve the symptoms, to which I, I vehemently disagree. Yeah. Uh, effectively, if you have no evidence of worsening core compression or red flag symptoms, as you just described, or muscle atrophy, ficulation, basically signifying a significant nerve root compression um, that would require a surgical consultation, potentially, then it will resolve on its own, regardless of what you do. And my favorite saying, I think you, you spun off, and uh, uh, you said, what are you going to do, not train? Yeah. And my thing always was, well, you can either be strong and hurt or weak and hurt. I mean, because you're going to get better. Yeah. So that's the thing. When anybody with low back pain, my first thing, you're going to get better. Yeah. Here are the expectations. Mm -hmm. I expect that within months, this is going to be in your rearview mirror, mm -hmm. you know, and then you also have to rule out anything that would not get better with training. But things that would get worse with training would be those red fat flag symptoms, uh, which are ultimately just symptoms of worsening cord compression from a very large lesion. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so, and so, you know, the way to think about this is not that training is going to be a problem for them because the baseline expectation is that this sciatic nerve type symptoms, assuming we're talking about the sensory stuff, as you described in the question, is going to get better. And so what does training also help to do? It also helps to teach them that they're going to be okay. And so you're almost, it's almost acting both as, hey, it's getting them stronger and that's great. It's also almost acting as a prophylactic against them getting worsening chronic back pain, central sensitization, that kind of stuff, developing that over time. So you're actually preventing them from progressing to a worse chronic low back pain state by having them train and kind of reinforce that mental approach. Yeah, I mean, it's therapeutic in two different ways. Yeah. yeah. It makes them stronger and also tends to help fix the, yeah. one of the underlying pathologies. Because this is sensitization of right. the nervous system. This is the exact opposite of what they'll get when they go to, say, a doctor. Yeah. And just don't do tell them, don't move. Your disc is about to explode. You've blown your disc out. Yeah. Your, your, your disc exploded. Your back is on the verge of you know, fracture, you're going to, if you bend over, you're going to be paralyzed for the rest of your life. That's the stuff that makes this way worse. So, so. and I don't remember the data offhand, but the effect size for increasing physical activity, as I recall, for low back pain is way higher than for a stress dose steroid pack, <laughs> which, right. which, which, which definitely reduces inflammation. Although people, you feel, and it just makes people feel good. Yeah. You generally sense of well, well-being. Makes you euphoric, sometimes psychotic. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes psychotic, makes your blood pressure go up. Whatever. Whatever. That's fine. Uh, and also pain, uh, analgesics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, hey. so training is the modality of choice. Train, yo. Assuming no contraindications. Also, do you guys think it's BS that manual therapy used by PTs to assess individual vertebra mm -hmm. and SI joint hyper or hypo mobility can explain the patient's source of pain? Take it. Yes. <laughs> We're hitting on all my, my favorite topics right now. So another, another very, interesting, uh, very interesting paper that I came across recently had a number of manual therapists uh, who were instructed to basically find the PSIS. They couldn't do it. Find the posterior superior iliac spine. 
Yeah. So just and to let everybody know, that's on the backside. It's a very prominent, bony landmark yeah. that you would estimate should be able to be reliably found by a skilled manual therapist or, or even a physician who yeah. are not. Yeah. And so, in fact, the Kappa score for this study, which is basically a statistical measure of agreement between raters. So what people are agreeing is, where the same spot is. Right. So you have a bunch of different people come assess the same thing and they say, yep, it's here. Yep, it's here. Yep, it's here. So the statistic that is meant is that is used to reflect that. I think it was around 0 0.27, which seems is low. Seems low. The ideal 100% agreement would be one. So this is a normal anatomical landmark that they were unable to agree on. There's a number of other studies like this. There's another one where they had a number of trained massage therapists. They had patients with back pain brought to them. And the patients were instructed to basically say nothing, do nothing, just lie there. And the manual therapists were How do I based, on palpation, <laughs> based on, based on palp palpation and physical exam, unable to even determine what side the patient's back pain was on, much less like where it was specifically at like a specific vertebral level or something like that. They were essentially no better than guessing as to whether the back pain was more on the left side or the right side of these patients. Right. So there's tons of stuff like this even when it comes to normal anatomy, abnormal anatomy, uh, even radiologic findings. We talked about this study recently. A, a one patient with sciatic nerve symptoms was sent for 12 different, 10 different MRIs, and there was like 50 different interpretations of this MRI study. And so, yeah, I completely agree that uh, any therapist who tells you that they can feel this hypomobile segment and blame that on your pain, they can feel that your one vertebrae is a millimeter subluxed relative to the other, all this stuff, and blame your back pain on that is BS. Oh, what I can say. Yes. All right. Yeah. They Don't do. let them scare you about your structural yeah, but inadequacies. But they, they got to eat too, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose they do. Find a new skill. Yeah. All right. Jo Joe. Oh, shoot. Josu the Ray. Who should take a vitamin B12 supplement, if anyone? Well, I can make a case for the following people to take a B12 supplement. If someone is verifiably low B12 sure. levels, which itself has a Differential diagnosis. Correct. <laughs> so it has a differential diagnosis and requires lab studies, mm -hmm. not just one. So you have to get a B12 and you have to get, you know, send them for pernicious anemia workup and you have to, you know, make sure that they don't have uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Exactly. Of other things. Sure. Yeah. Then you can start them on B12. Yep. <laughs> uh, or I can make a case for the vegan athlete um, who theoretically, since B12 is only in animal products, um, you would expect them to maybe low. Hey, that's another cat. <laughs> it's actually the same cat. Yeah. But this dude loves to get on, get on camera. Hey, it's good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would expect, I, I would say that them supplementing with B12 would be fine. I don't think that other people need to supplement with B12. I don't think there's anything wrong. Like B12, you know, hi hypervitaminosis B12 is super low. Um, well... Yeah, but it can happen. What if? What would you think if you happen to have a patient who came in and not being on supplementation, they had a vitamin B12 level of 1,200? Seems high. Yeah. Yeah, how do they do that? I've seen it before. Yeah. Hematologic malignancies. Yeah, like that. yeah, that makes sense. I've seen it before with leukemia. Yeah. yeah. Just completely off topic, but yeah. interesting. What was, their, what was their hemoglobin? I don't know. They have polycythemia? They have polycythemia with that, just the overall clonal expansion of all the cell lines? I think there was... No, it was leukemic, so they were anemic. Oh, oh okay. Or okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got it. Uh, more interesting. More thing. interesting. <laughs> more interesting. It, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, usually in the clinic, if some, we have a suspicion that someone may be low on B12, so it's a person with maybe some mild cognitive impairment or uh, macrocytosis. Neuro weird neurological symptoms. Yeah, a handful of things. So we send a, uh, you know, we'll send a B12, and we always send with it a folate. Mm -hmm. Always slow yield, but we do. Um, interestingly, you know, one of the supplements that I recommend people take is betaine and hydrus, which is trimethylglycerin. So it's a glycerin molecule with three methyls attached to it. Mm -hmm. So trimethylglycerin, TMG. Um, it is a uh, basically a choline sort of uh, uh, metabolite. So it's involved actually in the methylation process, just like folate is. Mm -hmm. So people who have like who would benefit from folate administration. So those are the MTHFR like. Right. homozygous mutation, mm -hmm. you know, so hypomethylated folks um, may benefit from folate or taking betaine and hydrous from beetroot. Cool. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, <laughs> even more <laughs> interesting. The second interesting, <laughs> the mechanism of action outside of methylation is it's a functional osmolite. 
like creatine, mm -hmm. draws water into the cell, that's an anabolic stimulus to muscle cool. growth. All this and more with Barbell Medicine <laughs> Seminar. <laughs> Come hang out with us. Come hang out with us, please. Please. <laughs> please. We're lonely. We're lonely. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of adjustments might need to be made in a squat for kyphosis? I actually take this one because I had a guy that I used to coach with Schuerman's kyphosis. So mm -hmm. that is a very large, bony uh, abnormality that cannot be fixed through training. It's just structural mm -hmm. anomaly. Um, so he could actually not high bar squat. The bar would actually roll off of his back. And, 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 yeah, it and would so, roll like off of his kyphosis. Co correct, like all the way up to his neck and like crush his cervical spine. Okay, I see. So he had a low bar. Yeah, he low bar fine. We struggled with getting the bar flat. Like that was a hard thing because he had some uh, rotoscoliosis with that as well. Mm -hmm. But and benching was kind of difficult unless he was super, super. You know, shoulders were super pulled back. Mm -hmm. That being said, we just you know he wore a grippy shirt and chalked and he squatted four hundred five. Oh, I think I know you. Yeah, yeah. But hey, yeah. I'm just saying. They can train. They, yeah, can train. Here's the thing. You can't fix it with rows and pull-ups and, you know, all that weird stuff. It's structural. Uh, and then there's a postural kyphosis that exists and effectively is defined as a kyphosis that is seen upon observation that you can correct. Voluntarily, voluntarily eliminate. eliminate. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. so things that don't fix that, K-tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, also the sling, you know, the, the, the manual rules. Dummy. Donnie Thompson's, uh, yeah, what is it, it just, called? The bow tie? The bo is that what it is? I think that's I think what it's it, called. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't fix it. It's silly. Yeah, yeah it, basically, since a person has voluntary control, they can just do it voluntarily or not. Yeah. And stand up straight. So relaxing into a bow tie isn't going to change. No, it might make a word. You might, so I imagine <laughs> somebody's getting like a break, like a plexopathy. Right. From yeah. like chronic compressive force yeah, on you know, like herb <laughs> palsy from this thing. All right. Yeah. Why do bodybuilders and strength athletes take exogenous insulin for its supposed anabolic effects when they still need to eat a corresponding amount of carbohydrate to avoid hypoglycemia? Well, so they need to eat the carbohydrates because insulin's going to lower their blood sugar. Mm -hmm. That's why they take the carbs. carbs. Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, because they'll die. Yeah, because they'll actually go hypoglycemic and die. So yeah. hypoglycemia is a much a more worrisome situation than hyperglycemia. You can roll around with your blood sugar in the 400s and 500s for... Just had, you know, just had a patient this morning who was 495 in clinic. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you're like, how are you alive? Just get your little insulin clinic and send her on her way. Oh, really? Yeah. That means, Outpatient management. There you go. Once a follow-up, three days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so wouldn't the same similar amount of exogenously induced insulin be produced endogenously? No. Uh, so... Oh, okay. that's kind of the point. Yeah. So basically, if you're taking exogenous insulin in a non-insulin dependent person, so insulin dependent people would be like a type one diabetic, or the burned uh, out type two. Yeah, right. Just the late a late onset of type mm -hmm. one diabetes. Who's are we're smart. Sure. Let's use that. Sure. Um. <laughs> so those people actually have like fasting insulin levels around zero, right? Whereas a uh, normal fasting insulin level is considered less than fifteen. Although there, you know, if you go look at the data, you can find insulin resistance. Start to creep up as that as that number goes uh, goes up. But uh, insulin sensitive individual, their fasting insulin levels are going to be around five, um, give or take. Taking more insulin um, effectively, the main way it affects muscle growth is by preventing uh, muscle catabolism. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily an anabolic thing as far as like stimulating muscle protein synthesis, although it is involved in you know, getting that muscle protein synthesis response to to go initially. Um, it's more of decreased muscle protein breakdown. Right? Yeah. So that being said, when you go look at data to look at does super physiological do super physiological doses of insulin and in, you know increase lean body mass, you don't necessarily see that at a higher level. Same thing with human growth hormone. So Oh yeah, you've talked a lot about HG. Well, <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Leaf village hokage. Why are some people sticking points in the deadlift near the lockout? The moment arm on the back is very short at the lockout compared to the bottom. Because they rounded their back. They rounded their back, and so they've lost their mechanical advantage to extend the hip. Yep, you see it all the time. Watch the way that, watch what their back does as soon as they pull the bar off the floor. It rounds, the bar flies off the floor, gets past their knees. They take about eight seconds to lock it out, or they just miss. Yeah, they miss. Or, yeah, they get white lights from not being fully extended because their shoulders are Their shoulders are still forward, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so that's the thing. So why would you round your back? What are the advantages of rounding your back in the deadlift? Well. As, as a resident as, as background, <laughs> as the guy who does that to yeah. shorten the distance between the bar and his hips. Yeah, yeah. So that um, that's that's how you get the bar off the floor. And if you have very very strong erectors, then you can sometimes reclaim 
spinal extension at the top. Yeah, that's actually the limiting factor is how strong are your spinal erectors in order to concentrically uncurl your back at the top of the deadlift. Which is why I have two anacondas on my back. <laughs> Jipper32 says, check your DMs, flame emoji. Excuse me. J. Richardson39 <laughs> says, how to manage increasing both press and bench as intermediate without overtraining the anterior delts. Uh, this supposes that the press and the bench press preliminarily or primarily target the anterior delts, which I would take issue with that supposition. I would argue that you don't need to worry about overtraining a fraction of your deltoid muscles. Right. They might get too strong. <laughs> <laughs> you would hate for that to happen. Yeah, you'd hate to get be too strong. Just like anything else, it's going to be a matter of titrating up your, your training volume over time, if you agree with our... <laughs> Yeah, programming theories, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, the only way to make your press and bench go up is going to be by pressing and benching. Yeah. So, so your, your anterior delts are getting super strong, so your lateral delts, so your posterior delts, so your serratus muscles. So. Yeah, I'm actually doing this with, uh, with Alan right now, Alan Thrall, because he's going to do the starting strength meet, and then uh, about two months later, I think he's going to plan to do a powerlifting meet. So we're actually trying to keep a decent amount of benching in the mix as well, despite the fact that he's also pressing pretty sure four times a week right now so more interestingly the question is how well does a bench carry over the press and the press carry over the bench and i have a nice little thing about yeah. this okay go for it the less trained you are the more <laughs> substantially the press carries over to the bench press and the bench press carries over to the press sure once you're very well trained i think they carry over very little to each other insofar as even if i got my bench up to 500 Theoretically, I'm not sure if my press would increase. Sure. Yeah. But the father of my bench would be sick. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> La Flama Blanca, great name. That's a cool name. What to do after the bridge? You, well, you need to hire a coach. Yeah. A as evidenced by this, you ran a program that was designed by two very good coaches, no bias. <laughs> <laughs> and you got presumably good results, and you'd like to continue that. But prior to running that program, you did not have the skill set required to assess what you needed, how to program that, et cetera, et cetera. So afterwards, I'm not sure if that situation changed. And if training is very, very important to you, then it may be worth the financial investment to get a coach. Yeah. Yeah, there's not going to be a standardized answer, unfortunately. That's the, that's the problem. We get asked these kind of questions all the time. And once you're past, I mean, we're trying to help people out a little bit after the novice LP because it ends up not lasting all that long for most people. Yeah. Um, to give them something in order to basically as, you know, to set them up for the kind of training that they'll need to do in later stages of training, hence the name, the bridge, T part, TB. Um, but yeah, I mean, stuff gets more complicated. So this is where we start asking you a bunch of detailed questions instead of saying, oh, you're starting out with this program, you're going to do three sets of five, and you're going to come back two days later. Now we have to say, who are you? How old are you? Male, female? What's your training background? How things much, like yeah. That. How often do you have to train? Yeah. What's the, Yeah. Yeah, so likely need a coach, and I actually do think that most people require coaching, just in general. All right, manager of opposition business. <laughs> Weird. Getting sharp shoulder pain for a split second in your left anterior delt only when setting down the bar after deadlift. Is this some sort of grip issue, or is this common at all? Uh, I don't think it's common. Yeah, that's weird. Sounds like biceps tend to meet, but if it's sharp... But only happens. Maybe are you saying like if it's on his supinated hand, yeah. if he's mixed gripping? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't. I don't really or know. Or maybe nothing. Probably nothing. It's probably going to get better on its own. Probably nothing. Or you have this huge like neck lesion that's just <laughs> unilateral. <laughs> all right. So that's all the questions. Now I'm going to give us. It, we've been recording now for about 45 minutes. So I'm going to give us six minutes and 30 seconds to talk about what we're doing this weekend. Well, we'll talk about that after. So I'm going to give us. <laughs> I'm going to give us six minutes and 30 seconds to talk about anabolic resistance, volume sensitivity, the elderly trainee. All right. So let me set the stage. We're going to define elderly or older trainee as somebody over the age of 50. Now, that should be not considered a hard line. So uh, biologically, somebody who's 55 may actually respond, you know, like a younger person chronologically. Mm -hmm. um, but let's just, for the sake of this argument, we'll just say 50 and older. All right. There is a thought out there that these, this cohort of trainees are uniquely sensitive to volume insofar as that really can beat them up. It even being stated that 
doing two sets of five with the empty bar after a single heavy set of five would be uniquely uh, uh, stressful, causing a bunch of soreness that would impede further training. All right. And the premise for this discussion is that when we consider anabolic resistance in relation to protein, for instance, we know that older folks are more resistant to the signaling effects of protein, meaning they require almost a double dose to get the same effect as a young person. This is due to blood flow. Uh, they have less blood flow. This is ameliorated by certain medications like sodium nitroprusside or uh, lisinopril. <laughs> Nitroprusside is a little aggressive for yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, also, actual absorption and, of proteins. So, for instance, casein is like terrible in general for older people because it basically just coagulates in the stomach. And so the amino acid levels in the blood are not as robust as they would be with whey, which is a big signaling molecule or big signaling uh, uh, impetus for muscle protein synthesis. Um, and also just a hormonal milieu, so just less testosterone floating around. Sure. Um, and their insulin response is usually compromised. Uh, interestingly, also you can induce anabolic resistance in younger folks by having them detrain for 10, uh, or not trained for 10 days. Mm -hmm. So, in your opinion, Austin, is there any validity to this volume-sensitive sort of notion going around? So this is something that we've been talking a lot about recently, and I think part of it stems from the terminology itself, calling them... Uh, volume sensitive the nomenclature the, yeah the nomenclature sure because i think that it carries the implication or at least i would ask in response to that terminology what does that imply about the non-elderly population does that imply that the younger folks are volume resistant or that they are volume insensitive because we talk about anabolic resistance and in terms of their sensitivity or their or their resistance kind of on a spectrum to anabolic stimuli. So if they're sensitive to volume, does that mean that a young person is resistant? Does that mean that I can throw a thousand sets of training volume at a young person and they will not respond to it because they are resistant? Yeah. And of course, the thing is that we all want to be sensitive to training volume insofar as it provides us with the stress that we get, uh, that we generate an adaptation from. So we would actually make the argument that a younger trainee is actually more volume sensitive. It, based on the way that the term, the, based on the way that the word sensitivity is sure. typically used, it might be semantics. So this. that's that's part of that's part of the issue here. But the the, the 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 more fundamental issue with the argument is kind of the logical inconsistency between saying that you have a trainee who is has a high degree of anabolic resistance needs double dose of protein but needs half dose of training compared to the younger individual. Now, of course, this gets complicated because the comparison is going to be, what are you going to throw five sets of five at a five RM weight or something like that at an old person? And the answer is no, of course not. Um, the dose of stress needs to be titrated uh, over time, but you need to understand that an, old, an older person in the same way as a younger person will adapt over time to a training stimulus. And so if, you know, volume, your ability to tolerate training volume is a physical characteristic in the same way that strength is a physical characteristic in the same way that endurance is, yeah. all these other ones that we talk about. And so if you apply the stressor of training volume to somebody, they will adapt to that training volume. Yeah. Of course, this needs to be kind of couched in the context of what the intensity is. And this is where this discussion oftentimes falls apart or people are talking past one another. because they talk about volume as this kind of like singular monolithic training variable outside the context of intensity. Or intensity is presumed, might be presumed to be high. Yeah, which we would not necessarily, which we would not necessarily do. Because both in our personal experience but with our own training, experience with training uh, a number of other clients, and not the scientific literature as well. Literature suggests that you can get muscular hypertrophic benefits from a very wide range of loading. Uh, yeah, loading any, intensities, any, almost any loading, almost any loading intensity. I think it's above like thirty percent or something like that. But and then to get the strength, in, in order to be able to express the strength as a result of that training in the strength task that you're using to measure uh, measure the, the the subject's strength, they need to be exposed to some heavy weights, which neither of us would disagree with. Correct. But you can get a significant training stress. We use it with ourselves, with our trainees. You know, some will sometimes go as low as 65% or something like that, sometimes even lower with ourselves and work our way up over the course of a training cycle. And so perhaps it might be that that older trainee who you fear is going to get beat up by something might not be the best candidate to receive a program indicating that he needs to do five sets of three at 
eighty nine percent of their one RM. And it has to go up over time. And it has to go up over time to continue making adaptation, make, uh, generating adaptation. Because of these two variables, training volume, training intensity, one of them is essentially infinitely titratable. Yeah. The other one, intensity, runs up against the hard limit at one hundred percent one RM. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Volume you can keep titrating up over time, and that's why it's been shown basically to be the primary driver of muscular adaptations. Yeah, I agree. I think said we can try to say this in some elegant fashion. You know, um, in in so far as you, an older person needs more protein to overcome their anabolic resistance to generate the same effect as their young, a younger trainee they will likely need a larger training stress to generate the same response as a younger trainee. Mm -hmm. Although the absolute magnitude of that protein dose or that training stress may in fact be lower. Right. So because you're looking for the same adaptation, you're looking for the same response. Right. If you yeah. gave the same dose to both, you'd get a way bigger response out of the younger person. Correct. Right. But you would expect that because they're more, more sensitive, volume sensitive. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I think we, we stated that fairly Elegantly, if I, yeah. you know, biased data. I just kind of laid it all out there. And yeah, it's tied it up nicely. Tied. Yeah, tied. Nice tied. Tied. Okay, so let's spend a few minutes just talking about what we're doing this weekend. So we're here at the Barbell Medicine Seminar, the inaugural one here in San yeah. Antonio, Texas. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this was something that I think I sent you a text about. I was like, hey, you no, know we should do. <laughs> <laughs> so for some context, we send each other these ideas all the time. I think it's almost like a multi-weekly occurrence where we're like, idea and we have something to do yeah it's this always one, this, this how it goes is also yes also and we know something's coming like that so i got but this one i got that text and then my mind started kind of racing about the possibilities with this thing and then i think that evening which i don't do for almost any other idea we have i immediately opened up a google document and started churning out ideas for this thing yeah so so i think you know long-term goal Oh, well, so the, the, what is it? The Barbell Medicine Seminar, the idea is that we're going to take the reasons why most people would either inquire about uh, to the doctor, go see their doctor, or inquire for medical care, and what can we do about those things with training, um, nutrition, and lifestyle modification, in addition to a data review on what we know about those things. So topics include um, cholesterol, so just dyslipidemia hypertension, so blood pressure elevations, testosterone, low back pain, um, nutrition, we talk about programming, and this is going to be specifically tied into, you know, how do you get different populations training? Um, we are going through a bunch of different things, and the idea is that eventually this serves as sort of a bridge, see, you see what I did there, <laughs> between the medical community and the strength conditioning community. Because I think both of us agree that using strength training, nutrition changes, and lifestyle modification overall as a therapeutic modality or preventative modality is very, very strong. Yeah. Uh, but right now, there's just not a singular resource out there that's really just, we're just being clobber people over the head with. Mm -hmm. So we want to do that. We're going to be that resource. We're going to be that resource, yeah. So that's what we're doing with the up-to-date thing. That's what we're doing with the seminar. And I think the idea is we keep expanding this. We keep tightening it up. And ultimately, it's worth continuing medical education units, it's worth continuing education units for trainers, PTs, stuff like that. The overall idea is to get more professionals and more people in the community aware of the stuff. So that way, your doctors are routinely recommending squats, mm -hmm. deadlifts, presses, and not just walking or nothing. Yeah. Or if, they, if you're happening to see a doctor who's uneducated on this stuff, either as a patient who might attend or a person uh, you know, who might attend the seminar, or as a trainer who might have some clients who attend this seminar, uh, you might be a little bit better informed about these issues and how they kind of pertain to your, your client or your own training. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, we're going to continue to tighten this thing up. Really excited. Yeah. It's gonna be, also super nervous. Yeah, I think we'll do all right with this first one. Uh, but uh, I think it's definitely going to be just like every other kind of seminar type product out there. I'm sure it's going to improve dramatically over time. Or at yeah. least I hope so. Human alien hybrids, 100 years from now, <laughs> <laughs> you will now understand that the Barbell Medicine Seminar has taken, on, <laughs> has taken on a completely different form. Yeah. Um, but until now, yeah, I think you said it earlier, and we'll say it again. If you want us to come to your city, we'd love to. We just need a gym. Yeah. Yep, we need a gym a and a weekend. Yep, a gym yes. and a weekend. Yep. So um, we'd like to get on the East Coast. We'd like to be in the Southeast. We'd like to be in the Northwest. We'd like to be everywhere. So we have some relationships we're building. Um, we're going to try to do this up right. Uh, but yeah. So hey, 
It's been episode 15. All right. Austin. Awesome. Thanks for joining us. Sure. Thanks for having me. Good whiskey. Catch you guys next time. Later.